Hi everybody, I'm Alejandro, I'm a researcher here at IID and I lead some of our work on food systems, um, a bit of agriculture, a bit of markets, a bit of consumption, so we try to do a little bit of everything. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to IID and to introduce our guests. Uh, before I do that, I just mentioned that we have an empty chair here for a third guest who is on her way. She's coming all the way up from Scotland and we expect you to be here soon. So when she comes in, we'll be this <laughs> yes. round of applause, please. Um, and I'll briefly tell you what we want to achieve. I'll just spend a few minutes doing that. So first, our uh, guests who have arrived. Teresa Pinto Correa, she's a professor at the University of Eura in Portugal, and she was the lead of this big, enormous European research project called SALSA, and she might explain why they chose that particular <laughs> acronym. Uh, I assure you that there was no dancing involved in any of the work. Um, and Teresa has a very kindly accepted our invitation to come from Portugal just to tell us what this project was about and I think it's a very pertinent and current discussion about the, the future of farming in the EU. Then we have Vicky Hurt, she's at Sustain, and she's a very well-known activist and campaigner on all sorts of food and farming related issues. Some of you uh, will have uh, met her or heard about her. Um, we're very glad that she was able to make it. And our third guest, uh, well, I'll introduce her when she arrives again, but she is Rosemary Champion, who uh, runs a small smallholder cooperative or association in Scotland. And she was, in a way, linked to this research project that Teresa is going to talk about. So she's not a stranger to the project, even though we haven't met her personally. But she's, you know, she knows how the project. Let me explain in a couple of minutes why small-scale farming and why at IID, in particular, why small-scale farming in Europe at IID. And I'll kind of break that into two. And the first part, why small-scale farming? IID's mission and a lot of our work has to do with what we say or construe broadly as the poor and marginalized. And so across IID, we work with small-scale enterprises in forestry, in food, uh, community organizations. We have very strong partnerships with, with, um, with organizations around the world, but always in a way uh, looking to work with and associate with and work together with people or groups of people who have less voice or who are less power. That is kind of in the DNA of IID. So naturally, when we look at food and agriculture, we kind of tend to uh, drift to that part of the food system. Small-scale production, small-scale markets, small-scale uh, retailers. Um, and so for us, small-scale farming is part of our bread and butter, and I, I co-lead the food systems work at IID along with my colleague Barbara, who was also involved in Salsa, and our, uh, particularly Barbara, whose, whose expertise is in agriculture. Small-scale is kind of our bread and butter, what, what we encounter in, in our work every day. What is less common for IID is this focus on Europe, because for those of you who know IID and those of you who don't, our purview and portfolio of work is really in developing countries, particularly Africa, but also Asia, Latin America. So that's where we are. We are the International Institute for Environment and Development. So a lot of our work is looking at, at, the, at the developing world and the global south. So even though small-scale farming is part of our what we do, the whole Europe and UK thing is not. And I just wanted to briefly say a couple of things about that. One is why we ended up doing this and hosting this debate here. Partly it's by accident, or not accident, but by chance, we ended up involved in this project. And as Teresa will explain in a bit, the project, the mandate from the European Commission when they funded this project was, we want something on small-scale farming in Europe, and please include something, we don't know what, on Africa. It was a little bit like that, I'm exaggerating, but it was a little bit like that. 
And so somebody said, oh, IID knows how uh, small-scale farming in Africa. And so like, we kind of got tagged into the project. <coughs> so that is the practical reason why we're here. We are part of this project. But as we've been involved, and so we have, by having worked, by virtue of having worked so much in, in, in the developing world, world, we, to us, small-scale farming, as I said, is, is a normal thing. When we looked at Europe, we were like, oh, why is what's so special about small-scale farming? That's what we do every day. But we just realized that in the European debate and context, it's, not, it's a bit under the radar, actually. So while we, in Africa, it's everything, or most of it. Here, it's a little bit under the radar. So it was very intriguing for us to be involved in a project that was looking at something that thematically is very much in the core of what we do, but in a region that we didn't know anything about. And that region happens to be like our backyard. And so it's the, that contradiction wasn't lost. On us. We, know, we know a lot, we know much more about small-scale farming in Uganda than up in Scotland, or even closer in England. And we realized that as we speak of SDGs and the climate social challenge of not only of food, but across all domains, this idea of, of the universal in SDGs, we need to kind of, we need to practice it. And so we cannot just only look at Africa and Latin America, which we continue to do, and we do it very well. But that there are similar challenges, not, not identical, but there's, there's things that span all these places and that we need to be aware of. And that this project has a bit, has a big given us a chance to, to look at. So that is the context of, and of why we're here and why this project is being discussed here at IID. And I think I'll give it to Teresa, and the way we're going to run it, Teresa is going to give us a quick summary of <coughs> the project, what we found, what it was about, and then Vicky will have a chance to respond based on her experience in the UK, and then Rosemary, when and if she arrives will tell us a little bit about what a small-scale farmer in Scotland makes of some of this, right? And then we're going to open it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's my first time, even though I've been working together for years, it's the first time I'm, I'm here. And, um, yeah, I will quickly present the project. SALSA is just an acronym we choose for small farms, small food business, and sustainable food and nutrition security. And as Alexander said, this was not a project we, we built on something we were interested in, but something we were interested to reply to a call by the European Union. So it was an Horizon 2020 project, and the call was very detailed in what needed to be there. So you, do, you cannot really design what you feel you would like to do, but you are replying to something they want to know. And we think that mainly the, the interest was in revealing what is there about small farms, how, how are small farms doing, what is their role, because they are always or very often under the, the radar of policies, but also of knowledge of analytical results. Um, yeah, so we are almost at the end of the project. The project has run for four years. We have a lot, a lot of results, so I will only present very shortly because the idea is that we debate here. And I had a bit longer presentation, but Alexander cut it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now it's only a short part of it. But that was the countries we the studied. <laughs> yeah. So the countries we studied in Europe, we studied 25 regions, and it's not three regions, so it's medium-sized regions. And then a few, five in Africa only, because the idea was this. It's an European project, but then please understand also a little bit of Africa. And what we adopted from the beginning, which is new in relation to other projects we do deal with food systems, is that, that we were looking inside the region. So we adopted this territorial approach. We wanted to understand in each region what happens inside the region. What are small farms producing which stays in the region or goes out? Who is consuming what small farms produce? How are the relationship? Because we, we, the concern is that we also understand what in one region can condition more or less how small farms are um, behaving. So the, not just the biophysical <coughs> context, but how urbanized it is, how many people there are, how forested it is. So look at the region and understand the region. So th the whole thing, the whole project was concentrated on these 25 regions, and we have not studied outside it. So one of the things we did, which was very new, was to look at small farms from the perspective of these satellite images. 
So I will not develop it very much, but we have done these uh, maps of small farms' location and the crops they are producing in each of the regions studied. And it was validated with, with points in the field so that we now know exactly we have maps and we can continue monitoring what happens with small farms. So we have uh, combined the information from the, the satellite images with information from the field. And it's there so we, can, we have both assessed how much they are producing now, how big area they fill in each crop in the region, but also we can continue monitoring how they change. For instance, in relation to certain policies or certain types of market mechanisms, what will happen? And we can reply very fast because the satellite, they, they run every 10 days. So every 10 days there's a new image. So it's, it makes it very possible to assess very shortly, in short uh, term, what's, what's happening. And we produce these maps, which are maps in each region. For instance, this is a region in Portugal, one of the regions we studied. And there's the wine and the, um, the, the peer production. And what we, because we also did field work and interviewed small farms, so we could assess how much they are producing. So an estimation of the total production, and then we could match these to the total consumption. So we could assess how much of what small farms were producing would feed or be able to feed to the, the regional consumption. So we know that the food system is not, does not have these regional boundaries, but if we wanted to have it more localized, these food systems, what would be possible to be given by small farms to the consumers in the region? And we have some numbers, and it's just, I don't know if there is, well, but it's just, this is just to show you the, the bars, which are the upper part. They show that in these regions and for these products, we have much more produced in the region than it's consumed, than the consumption needs. So that it's possible, some of this is for export, of course, but we could re-centralize or re-localize food systems for some products based on the small farms production. That would be possible. So I'm not going into detail, but it's just to show in some regions, especially in Eastern Europe and in Southern Europe, we have like potatoes or fruit or olive oil, which is produced enough in the region for the consumption in the region. So from the remote sensing part, which was a big part of salsa, what we have, it's the main results is this, that we have many different crop types. So small farms have a huge diversity in crop types, what increases farm uh, biodiversity. And the smaller, the smaller the farms, the more diversity we have. So the more biodiversity, farm biodiversity there is, and the more landscape diversity also. They play, small farms play a central role in consumption for some of the key products we analyzed. And small farms also secure a very important part of the production, also which is sent for export. So in <coughs> some cases, most of the production also for export is production from small farms. So th they have a role also in the food and not just in, uh, in the communities or in rural development activities. <coughs> Then we, we did a survey to, all, to, to a sample of small farms in each region, so we did, we did inquiries. Um, we did also workshops and focus groups and uh, different types of workshops so at, at the regional level where we participated. And we, with the analysis of the old data for Europe, so now we are just talking about Europe, we came up to, uh, to this typology of small farms. And this is also new, that there is, there is different types which can clearly be identified. And there are, what we were expecting in the beginning is that there will be small farms which never relate to the market. They are self-provisioning farms. And small farms which are very specialized and connected to the market. And what we have is that all small farms somehow relate to the market, but they do it stronger or weaker. So we have a group of small farms which have more informal market orientation. And there we have the part-time farms, which very often is a lifestyle issue, and we have peasant farms, which are the ones which are poor. <laughs> they depend a lot on farming for the household economy. And, uh, and they connect to, they are older also, they connect to the market, but they also have a lot which is for their own um, household. And then we have the stronger market orientation, and we have some which are really very specialized, and I mean in Southern Europe, they're very specialized and they sell through cooperatives to export. But we have some which are new enterprises, younger people, which do different types of, they combine production with processing, they combine with different types of value chains. And we also have these, these are close to each other, but to, to diversify, they are more organized in cooperatives, while the other ones, they have different ways of marketing. And this is valid for the whole of Europe, and it shows that there are 
different types of small farms, but not really just self-provisioning and non-self-provisioning. They all do a bit of self-provisioning, and they all relate to the market, but in different ways. And some, these ones which we tend to think are very often in policies, there's a, a, um, an approach or a discourse about small farms that they are part-time or they are peasant farms which are very traditional. It's not really what we found. We found many of those rely on the market, relate to the market in a very uh, um, conscient way or aware way. That's what they want to do. So we also analyzed the food system, the farm, how the small farms are placed in the food system. We analyzed 109 food systems, so we analyzed the food system per product. So the food system for peer or the food system for, um, for potatoes or the food system for vegetables. And the first scheme is the one we used to discuss with the stakeholders in these participatory meetings, and that's the one we produced with the production and then linking to processing to distribution and to consumption. And it made it possible to see for us how many channels do small farms use to sell their products. How much of their production stays locally or goes to processing or goes somewhere else. And one of the main also results is to see that there are different types of food systems. The ones we have uh, high up here is the ones who are more locally oriented, so the food circulates more in the region. And here in this side, the D are the ones where there is a high share of small farms. So it's local food systems where small farms are very important and they are very more frequent in Eastern Europe. And then in Southern Europe we have more export oriented and that was a surprise. Uh, with a high share of small farms in some cases, like the olive production or the citrus production. And then in Northern Europe we have both um, export and locally oriented, but where small farms are not so important. Large farms are more important. That was the most important characteristic. And then what can we say? Once something which is very important is how small farms, who they relate to, and first, and they relate, they can relate to cooperatives, they can relate to processes, to direct selling. So you can say, you can see that B and C, which are the ones which are more locally oriented, they have, for instance, a lot of direct selling. So it's not always the same channels small farms use, and they can direct sell through direct selling, they have self-provisioning. Only a few relate directly to exporters, for instance. They relate more to, and, and some of those who are exporting is through cooperatives. That's in the A and C. So I know this is a lot of information, but hopefully <laughs> it will give you a picture. And this is something which we also find it's very important, is that self-provisioning is common across all food systems. So there is always an important share of the, what small farms produce, which, uh, so we have medium and high self-provisioning in all of the types of food systems. So this, in bars, what you have is a type of food system, so how it circulates in the region. But I think, so the food system analysis, that the main findings is that we have a high diversity of profiles. We, we are moving behind this subsistence commercial divide. Small farms contribute to food availability, stability, and also access. In different, in different food systems. And the first buyer matters. So how much, how they rely, who is, who is dealing, who is handling to the small farm. Small farms connection to small food business were weaker than what we expected. That can be due to different reasons. The small food business seemed to buy more to large farms or maybe we didn't get the right small food business. So this, we would need to explore this uh, more. And then I think something which is maybe more interesting is that what we are asking them also, what were the needs, and we are asking to, to, these, to, to the associations small farms are dealing with, what could be more important for them to be maintained and to continue and have a role in the food system. And one of them is access to technology and knowledge, so they are very much, very often they don't have access to support to extension services because they are paid or because they are organized to other sectors. And they were very much concerned about climate change. One of the questions we asked was about what risks they considered were the most important risks. And climate change, surprisingly, we would, thought, we would think it was not so important. But the problem also is that very often they are concerned about climate change and they don't have the resources to adapt to buying new technologies or they don't have access to the knowledge which would be needed for them to better cope with climate change. So this is, uh, this is a concern. 
the diversity of value chains is also, uh, they would like to continue being connected to value chains in a different way. So through non-conventional maybe value chains, which they don't, they don't have the capacity but on their own to uh, deal with. So they would like to have new dedicated quality schemes, that it was more, there was more support to uh, value chains which were linked to small farms particularly. Then they were asking for tailored policy uh, mechanisms because very often the, the needs or what is specified for a farm to sell their products, it's too demanding for a small farm. So they would like to have rules which are more specific in terms of uh, quality requirements. And then one, something which is very important is that they would need more support to collective action because there's cooperatives, but the cooperatives existing, they are very mainstream and they all sell in the same way and very often with no added value. So they would like to have more well-trained cooperatives or those who lead the cooperatives that could help them better. So maybe one of the poss possibilities is that the public support <coughs> would be more meaningful if it was given not to single farms, but to collective, uh, to groups of farms of these small farms. So we also have a bit on gender. So we found more women in smaller farms than normally there is in bigger farms. Uh, and maybe we could have, and also in the processing. Women are currently represented in small farms, but yeah, and we also found that there are more women in small farms, but very often they are in the, in the poor farms. So in the more poor farms, we have more women than men. <laughs> women are normally represented in the farmer organizations, but still, they are not so much, and those who are there, they are representing the rural part, so the processing or the distribution or rural activities and not really production. So, and there are support policies, but we don't have data to show what, what is the effect of the policy, so we need a bit more information. Then, just to fin finalize, what the, 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 the final work was to assess what were, how could policy help small farms. What were the policy mechanisms which, which could help them facing their needs what, and facing their differences in these uh, different types? What were the policy, um, possible policy mechanisms to help them? And we divided, in, because that, and that was all the result of these participatory processes, that they are small farms, they need support to exist, to be there, to, to do not abandon farming, to produce and to market. So there's the different types of support they will need. And this is generally for all the small farms in Europe. That, so they need, in some cases, better connectivity. They all need more support in terms of extension services. Some, in some cases, it's more for the marketing they need support, so the policy should reach. And for Northern Europe, that's what I brought here, because we did it per macro region, so Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and Northern Europe. In Northern Europe, especially in Scotland and Northern France, there's a big issue with access to land, so small farms are missing, uh, would like to have policies which help them to have access to land and to market and to, to provide added value to the quality of their products. So the marketing issue, it's, it was really uh, made very clear that there was a, a need. While in Norway, for instance, there was more connectivity because they are much more isolated and the question of people, to have enough people to deal with or enough people, so a, a community which is alive it's a problem in Norway, which is not a problem here. So in terms of priority measures or policy measures, there would be the question of the regulation of the land reform in Scotland, so that it would be more easy to have access to land. Rural services, so depending on the common agriculture policy, but now also on, on the UK mm -hmm. policy, to have more services to help farmers, and probably new proposals, which they are not there, but this question of new collabor collaborative models to have access to land, so that small farms can be together, together have access to land, working cooperatives or in another farm or form of organization. For the, for, the pol for the products, there was a, a very high demand for this more clear food brands, more clear brand, uh, branding of small farms <coughs> products. Um, alternative food networks which would really recognize the value of these uh, small farms and then well more support for food businesses because if there were food businesses maintained in rural areas very often the support is very short term and then they cannot keep on the long run. So this is 
part of the, the result, we have the same for Southern Europe, for Eastern Europe, and they are different. The, the needs are different, so this strongly, um, for, from our point of view, defends that we should have policies which are tailored to the different needs, different types of small farms and the different types of regions. And that's all. I mean, that's, there's a lot more in South, and I hope to have some questions from you, but that was what I was allowed to present. By <laughs> <you>. <laughs> I wasn't being mean by asking her to be succinct. It was just the way we organize here. But are we allowed to take questions, or maybe, maybe, maybe we can take just a couple of quick questions, pressing questions, just after Teresa's presentation, before I hand it over to to Vicky. Um, I didn't catch that. How um, how do you define a small farm? Yeah. Yeah, I should have mentioned it. So we debated that a lot in the beginning, also even before we applied for the project, because we wanted to, to show that we knew how to define a small farm, but still we had to continue discussing when we had the project, because it's, it's very context dependent. So what we defined when we did the first analysis, we did it based on existing indicators, and then we had to define a threshold, and that was five hectares or eight economic units, which is about 8,000 euros per year as an income. And that, that, but that was, uh, we know it's not good enough, but we had to define in order to classify the regions where how small farms were distributed in different regions to select our regions, we defined this. But then when we went into the regions, we worked very much participatory. And the first key informants, they helped us to say, in this food system, if you consider this threshold is too small or is too big. So we adapted a little bit. But we, mainly it's small in relation to the remaining uh, farm structure. So if you have, for instance, lamb producers, they need a lot of grazing area. They are typically extensive, so they need more land. But they can, if they have only 10 sheep or 20 sheep, they are still small farms. So we adapted a little bit, and it was, so we accept differences depending on the context and depending on the food system. So smallness, smallness is more defined in relation to the context and to the farm structure. But there's a kind of approach, the five vectors was used, and for the world normally two hectares is used. Five hectares for Africa would be too big. But for Europe, two, two hectares would really be too, too small. So, welcome back. Thank you for an excellent, very interesting presentation. You mentioned that um, ideally support would be given to groups of small farmers rather than individual farms. But if the farmers are not aggregated in some way through cooperatives or whatever structures, how would that be done? Yeah, but what, they, what the demand was really to help farmers organizing themselves. So the idea was especially for having access to land, as the prices of land are very expensive, it will be difficult also to the small farms to buy small pieces of land. But if there could be any type of new mechanism to help them get something together, so it could be, you know, you could buy land together, maybe divide it, or work together, that will be, so it's, it's, that's why it's new. It's somehow, you know, maybe a solution is that you help small farms work together for being able to have access to land in a more efficient way than just alone. And I think this, the, the question is that there are organizations helping small farms, but very often they are very traditional and they have not really moved, while you have more innovative uh, organizations in other, you know, in other types of farms. In small farms, many of the cooperatives we found, they are very mainstream, and they, they don't come up with this type of new solutions. Maybe one more and then we can move on. Please. Yeah, um, in your introduction you briefly explained that African cases were supposed to be integrated, but I'm just wondering what the, what the rationale behind that was, especially with regards to the results you just presented. It wasn't really clear yeah. what the results from the African cases were and how they fed into yeah. your work. Well, yeah, we, we have the, typo the typology I presented, it's only for Europe because we thought maybe it was more interesting to present here because it's mm -hmm. what is different from what uh, IED normally does. But we have a typology which gathers all the farms, so it's about 1,000 small farms interviewed. And we have, the types are slightly different. We don't really have part-time farms in the same way when we put them all together. But they are more or less, this divide between strong and weak market integration is still there. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of... The f small farms in Africa, the ones who are peasant farms, they are poorer than the ones in Europe. So <coughs> we call them strugglers because they are, they're, they're more, the, the impression or the data we have is that they are struggling to survive. They continue doing farming because that's what they can do. But it's not so easy as it, in Europe, even if they are poor, 
they have a, a slightly higher income level in the family. So we have done exactly the same in the African regions. But it's difficult to say that we can say something about Africa, because Africa is a huge continent. We have only these five regions. While in Europe you have 25, so we, we cover uh, more of the, if, even if you cannot say it's representative, but we have a huge universe. And our population is very important in, in Europe and not in Africa. So in Africa we have different crops. We have more, more poor farmers, but we also have these ones who are connected to the market and we are, also have new, newcomers to farming who do different things. So it's a bit of the same with some specific characteristics. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Teresa. Um, and there's going to be more time for questions and discussion. So we'll keep your questions um, in the back. Vicky, can I invite you to? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I have to say, when I um, agreed to um, give a response to this work, um, it was kind of think, this is an area that Sustain is really interested in. We've done a, um, a lot of work to try and promote farm diversity and, and try and persuade people, politicians, of the value of farm diversity. Um, but I haven't actually done much of that in the last few, well, last couple of years. Um, and so it was a really good chance to refresh my thinking on it. So thank you very much on that. And I think this work is extremely valuable, and I will use it. So that's one reflection. Um, the work that we've been doing, just looking, thinking in the past, one of the um, big problems we've identified over the last, and many people have identified over the last um, few decades, is the, this massive loss of small farms and the loss of farm diversity. Um, in Europe, I'm talking particularly about Europe and particularly about the UK. Um, and what one of the reasons that Sustain came into existence was to try and counter that, um, and that was actually 30 years ago, although it was a different form then. But the alliance itself still cares very much about the continued loss of small farms because of the range of um, uh, issues that you identified. Um, I think some of them, um, in terms of the um, things that a small farm as part of a, of a diverse farm system, delivers for um, society. And it, it's jobs, it's um, maintaining rural cohesion, it's maintaining um, features in the landscape, which can be very important for tourism and the tourism pound. Um, thinking about passive environmental factors that can arise from a small farm compared to when a farm gets much larger. And they can be the passive meaning that they're not actively sought in, in these outcomes, but um, things to do with um, being smaller fields, um, maybe less tidy, less um, application of high inputs or high energy or high machinery, and things, things like that. So we identify that, and we, we have, um, a couple of years ago we did a, um, a, a statement on the need for specific support um, for maintaining a diverse farm structure in the UK. Because we and, and we identified what the reasons for doing that, and this is all on our website. You can have a look. But it, it's it's very interesting to hear your presentation with regard to this, because one of the things that we recognise is that if we lose further farms, and there are predictions that as a result of Brexit, we'll lose 25% of the farms in the UK, which would be a big loss in many areas. Um, but some people will see that as an inevitable outcome of a more market-oriented system. Um, and great, we'll just have lots of big farmers doing things very efficiently and, and very green and things like that. But there's loads of reasons for not doing that. So we, we've put together a, um, a statement and a set of um, policy asks. And it's interesting, your policy, you know, the kind of things you came up with, your policy, you didn't actually mention subsidies. And I, I was wondering if that came up in, in the discussions, because obviously subsidies have actually maintained a lot of the small farms across Europe. Um, they would have gone far quicker if we didn't have the common agricultural policy, and that, that's well recognised. And it's one of the reasons for the common agricultural policy to maintain employment in rural areas and maintain um, uh, the market and the um, activities in rural areas. Um, and now we're facing, both in the UK, um, a new agriculture bill, which was launched last Thursday, um, which I can talk about a bit more if, if, if we want to, but... Um, there's so much I could say about that. I don't quite know where to start and how it relates to what you've just talked about. Because um, I think um, a lot of it has been about um, changing the way we support farming in the UK to pay for public goods. And a lot of the time people are talking about public goods, they say the environmental public goods, the um, biodiversity, habitats, nature, possibly reducing pollution and protecting watercourses, etc. Whereas we'd like to see it as a much broader 
definition of public good, to maintain communities and deliver really um, sustainable and diverse farming systems in, um, in rural areas to deliver for potentially um, uh, large-scale um, uh, commodity markets but also for more regional and local markets. And we see a real benefit in growing those more local and regional markets, the diversity of production to do that, um, as we face a climate and nature emergency globally. We will, I think it's a global objective. We, we should see that we actually are starting to be able to feed ourselves better, rather than focusing on large-scale, export-led, um, very specialised farming systems, which have been the norm in terms of the direction of travel for our food system for the past 50 years. I think that, that norm, for the past 50 years, we've been getting more and more specialised, larger farms, ever more um, uh, specialised farming systems and centralised processing systems globally. And that's really hitting Africa at the moment. You can see that in many um, of the livestock industry and developments there. But if, if you get more and more specialised, you lose the capacity to really feed yourself and to deliver where you need to on um, diversity at, at the local level, and that's not just not biodiversity, but diversity in farming and diversity in food. It's a big, big things to be talking about. I'm sorry, but they are brought up by what you said. I think it's really interesting how you talked about whether small farmers do relate to the market, and you found they did. And I think that's really encouraging, and that's what we really need to encourage. And that's why I've got a, a programme of work which is about um, really building up the... Um, better trading platforms for small farms mm -hmm. and, and for medium-sized farms. In the UK, small farm is very different, as you noted, mm -hmm. from a small farm in R Romania, for instance. But they don't now have the capacity, the, the storage, the milling, the abattoirs, the cutting rooms, all the infrastructure that they once had to be able to serve a market in a region, that's all gone. Largely, and we're losing abattoirs at a staggering rate. I mean, that's that's a really big issue for a lot of the small-scale meat producers, and and the the growing number of people who want to do meat really sustainably and ethically. It's really hard because they can't find a, a local abattoir. But those kind of things we really need to build up again. That's what we want to see. And relating the small farms to those development infrastructure, we want to see that as an outcome of farm policy, new farm policy as well as advice, as well as the technologies, that um, appropriate technologies, we say, that farms need access to. And the small farms, more than big farms, have, struggle, um, have a struggle in finding the time to access technologies and new, new, um, new uh, <coughs> ways of, of farming, to, to access the training and advice. So we need really farmer-led and farmer-scale training delivery. Um, for instance, low, um, helping your soil to... to um, have more carbon in it. That, there's a lot going on in the UK on that at the moment. It's really exciting, but is it reaching all the farmers and all the small farmers? Because they've got no time to get out of the farm. They've possibly got no um, uh, workers on the farm. It's all done with it. There's all these kind of things. It's got to be farmer-led and farmer-appropriate in order for them to actually get the benefit and to be able to work together. So I also think one final point, I think, absolutely clear in your work um, is the need for them to cooperate and collaborate together. And we're trying to persuade DEFRA um, that that... What they're suggesting now in terms of the new farm support scheme, which is in, UK, in England, it's called the Environmental Land Management Scheme, that farmers who group together in a landscape scale or in a catchment scale will get... get they'll get rewarded for doing it as a collection because you'll get um, larger... Outputs for the public, from, you know, bigger bung, bung for their back, for their taxpayers' money, um, if they work together to deliver on a catchment problem, you know, pollution problem, or to, to deliver a particular biodiversity outcome. We we are trying to persuade them that that, that should also be for small scale farmers that aren't contiguous. I'm just giving this as an example because. At the moment, DEFRA are saying it's got to be farmers con contiguous. It's side by side. They're neighbouring farms in an area because that's the biodiversity benefits or the catchment benefits or the is a big woodland um, corridor or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we we would argue that small farms, for instance, small growers doing horticulture in a in a region should be able to collaborate together and get and and get the benefit of an environmental land management scheme that recognises that they are delivering higher environmental or other, other outcomes, but they're not contiguous, they're not side by side, but they're delivering for the community. For instance, a lot of community-supported agriculture does a lot of work with local communities and getting them on the farm, getting them eating fresh produce. So all this kind of slightly less 
um, recognised public goods we would like to see in the final um, scheme. And I think what you were saying about those um, relating to market and collaboration and cooperation, farmers should be really supported in doing that and, and being able to um, uh, get a stronger um, part in negotiations with the market. And also with their suppliers, the seed suppliers and their machinery suppliers. You know, they've got to be able to collaborate and cooperate uh, together to, to get a fair deal there as well. Um, there's loads of things I think I'm saying, but I think there's a lot probably will come out of a discussion. Um, we've got a future vision for farming, which should include a diversity of farming. It should include small, medium, large farms um, for all the benefits that that matrix provides for society. But we are rapidly losing them, and we're going to lose loads more unless we do something about it. So very interested in this project and the outcomes, and we'll promote them. Thank you. Quick question or two for the Vicky? Quick. Vicky, hi. That's hi. Tricky. You said hi. that we're going to lose about 25% of the farms. Um, That's one of the um, assessments by a, a, a university. I can't remember which one. Can you tell me more about that? Or what, um, well, there's, there's a sort of... Basically, the, at the moment, there's the whole uncertainty that's been going on for three years, which is meaning we're already losing quite a rapidly quite a lot of dairy farms, for instance, at the moment. Um, but the, the twin um, effects of losing European market um, and possibly having tariffs put on our produce to, to the European market um, and diversifying from European um, standards, so we lose that market. All sorts of ways we're losing a really near market that is really useful for small and medium and large scale um, producers. So that there's that um, uh, big problem. There's the issue of a reduction in the basic payment scheme over time, over seven years, which is what's been planned. Um, but it will be replaced with the Environmental Land Management Scheme, or the new scheme in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, has got a different name, um, to deliver public goods. But in that process of, of a shift, in that transition, a lot of farmers will probably say, it's too complicated, I'm going out, I'm going. And that's, that's what some of the studies have, you know, the surveys of farmers have suggested. Um, and there's also the other problem of having to compete potentially with um, trading partners overseas in, in new trade deals where we're um, having to compete with very different standards, both labour standards, animal welfare standards, food standards, all those kind of things which could be a lot lower in the, in the um, trading. And if, if we're going very quickly into big trade deals with the US or Australia, they'll have to compete with those and it's going to be very, very difficult. A lot lower um, cost of production in those countries. So that's actually lots of reasons why they're under a lot of, of pressure at the moment. And I, I think it's um, something that the... I think DEFRA are very live to it, um, but they're working too slowly at the moment to, to think about ways to mitigate that. So, long question. Great. I'm actually going to stop there, and I'm going to take the questions at the end. Uh, let me finally introduce Rosemary Champion, who heroically, uh, all the way from Carnusti. Did I pronounce that? You did. Carnusti. Yeah, um, and just by way of background, the James Hutton Institute was one of the partners in Salsa and they did all the field work in Scotland. And so they hooked us up with Rosemary because she was one of the group of farmers that they interviewed and consulted for the Scottish side of, of this work. So she's no stranger to, to Salsa, but it's the first time you kind of like see the bigger picture. So please <laughs> have a seat. And can I stand at the lecture? You can. Because if I stand there, you won't see how few notes I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been, it's been an epic journey. Um, my train left the Waverley Station briefly, then it went back to the Waverley Station, <laughs> and then finally it left again. So we were 85 minutes late, which is good for you because you get to claim the train fare back. Oh. Yes. The European taxpayer. In fact. The European taxpayer gets to, to claim the, the, the um, if you're more than I think an hour late, you get to claim the money back. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me. It's it's been great fun. I I walked up Gray's End Road because I was told it would be much quicker to walk than get a taxi. I'm not sure that that's actually the case. <laughs> if I had my wellies on, I would have walked much quicker. Um, well. Just a few things that I was really jotting down on the train as I was, you know, I had extra time on the train. Um, Scotland is at a critical point, 
as is the UK. End of the month, we leave the European Union. Um, Scotland did not vote to leave the European Union. This is not our fault, okay? <laughs> this is not our fault. Uh, but we're leaving anyway. Um, for however long we'll see. Um, obviously, that has implications for the UK, it has implications for Scotland. For small farmers, I'm not so sure that it may turn out to be a bad thing because I think there are opportunities for very small farmers to um, access niche markets with small amounts of produce. Um, we farm 22 acres uh, just outside Dundee. We produce, we breed uh, rear Shetland cattle, we breed coloured dryland sheep. We raise a few pigs, we have what's called the Dalmo Croft Pig Club, where uh, members of the public can sort of rent a pig <laughs> for the summer and then they get the meat in the autumn. Um, and, and we do quite a lot of it, as you said, stuff for ourselves. We, you know, we eat a lot of our own produce and we sell the rest locally. Now I sell two steers a year and about, well, in a good year, maybe 15 lambs and maybe a couple of, some mutton, if some of the ewes don't get in lamb and they have to go the way of old ewes. Um, so, to be honest, the loss of export markets, I don't mind, it doesn't matter to me, I don't export anything, nothing goes further than Dundee. <laughs> Nor does the loss of subsidy particularly bother me, because what I get in subsidy totals about uh, maybe £600 a year. So, it's quite nice to get it, but if the government says you can't have it, then, you know, we'll manage. We're not going to go to the wall for that. Um, but my customers, who want locally, ethically produced meat, will still keep buying it. They won't stop buying it because there's uh, chlorinated chicken coming in from, from, um, from the USA, or hormone-fed beef, or whatever horrors land on our supermarket shelves. So I think for very small, and also my husband has a proper job. <laughs> <laughs> he just does the grunt work at the weekend. Um, so I think for, for many small farmers, very small farmers like us, um, maybe it's an opportunity. You know, I'm an eternal optimist. You have to be to be a farmer. Um, so maybe it won't turn out to be so bad. But there are going to be farms who are very, very severely hit. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and I think it's maybe going to hit the middle ground where they don't have the economies of scale, but they're going to be caught by cheap imports and prices for them. Because the prices plummet, um, they're going to be very adversely affected. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen next week? Never mind. <laughs> um, just to touch on what... You said about the, the Agriculture Bill. Um, Scotland declined to be part of the UK's Agriculture Bill. Um, we have our own bill currently before Holyrood. Uh, that, that went forward as a bill in November. Um, because I was coming here today, uh, I read it um, a couple of days ago. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> it was a gripper. Um, I actually read it and I thought, this can be it. There must be more than this somewhere. Um, but no, that was it. Um, and basically, the bill that's before Holyrood at the moment is a transfer of power. And that's all it is. It says nothing, it's it says nothing like what's in the UK. Yeah. 94 pages of UK one. The, I read the first page <laughs> of the UK one. Um, so we're still working away on that. And what the Scottish Government... I'm sorry if I'm telling you things you already know. This, what the Scottish Government has decided to do is that between um, 2021 and 2023, we're going for stability and simplicity. So the schemes, the Scottish Government intends to continue the current support schemes until 2024. And um, they will be broadly the same as they are now, but they're going to try and simplify some of the regulation. And then there's going to be this all singing, all dancing, new scheme that's going to start in 2024. One of the worrying things is that there is a group currently meeting, which is called the, you know, let me think, it's got a catchy name, Farming and Food Policy Future Working Group. Um, it's 
uh, supported by the Scottish Land Use and Rural Policy Department, which if you read it, it's slurp. <laughs> <laughs> I swear they have a department in Holyrood that just dreams up uh, the, the, the departmental title. Um, so slurp are sponsoring this working group and they're going to come up with new policies. Uh, they're looking at new policies which will feed into whatever support schemes we get um, <coughs> from 2024 onwards. This will either be, given the Scottish Government's rhetoric about climate change, food security um, and sustainability, this could be fantastic or it could be a total dance club. Ask me back in 2024 and I'll tell you <laughs> which I think it is. Um, I mean, a lot of the rest of the notes that I've got here, you know, you've already already reflected. Um, there's a there's a phrase in Scotland called the common wheel, and that's about public good. And public good has all of a sudden become very fashionable. It's everybody's talking about farming for the common for the for the public good. Well, you know, in Scotland we call it the common wheel, but, but it's the same thing. Um, and that's obviously going to be a big emphasis going forward. And I think that's right. Um, nobody really owns land. We steward it for the time that we have the, 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 the opportunity to do, to do that. But you kind of take it with you. Nobody makes it anymore. Um, so we are indeed farming for society. We're farming for climate, for climate uh, farming for the planet. Um, I thought it was interesting about the, the definition of a small farm because... Mm -hmm. um, Many of us, including the Scottish Government and, and other organisations, have wrestled with this one um, for, for a long time. Um, I thought five hectares was probably a decent, decent stab at it. Uh, and it is that balance of size versus purpose. Five hectares if you're raising cattle or sheep is quite small. Five hectares if you're raising perhaps goats or poultry, or if you're growing, particularly in a non-mechanised way, five hectares is a lot. And one of the problems, I think, with the current support scheme um, in Scotland is that the, the, the lower level is three hectares. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very difficult for growers to access funding. Mm -hmm. um, some colleagues of mine uh, have a market garden, and it's three hectares, mm -hmm. because three hectares gets you the money. Mm -hmm. But they actually farm less than half of that, because... That's all they can actually manage mm -hmm. to produce food on. So yeah. they've got a couple of hectares that you know they, they would quite like to use, but they can't quite get the figures together to do that. Um, but, but this three hectare uh, lower level is, it, it, I think it's excluding people, um, genuine farmers, from support because what they're growing doesn't lend itself to, to, to big areas. Um, and given the Scottish diet, I we really need more people growing fruit and vegetables. Um, we're very good at meat. We're very good at red meat. Um, we ain't quite so good at um, growing, growing, growing fruit and vegetables. Certainly on a local scale where it's, it's going into local markets. But as part of the salsa project, um, I was invited to visit some crofts. We had a couple of days in Inverness. I don't know if it, you've, you've been to Inverness lovely city, um, we got to visit some crofts, and what was really interesting was the diversity of them, but also how a lot of new crofters mm. are diversifying the mm. crofts, mm. and they're moving away from the traditional cattle and sheep to um, fruit and vegetables, they're putting up polytunnels, um, there's new technology available that stops your polytunnel blown away, which on the Western end is a kind of big thing. Um, so that's, that's really heartening to see, I think, but that needs to be wider spread than, than just located in, in the North West. Um, small farms have for far too long been the Cinderella sector of agriculture. Um, the worrying thing for, for me and for many of us small farmers is that this food policy, sorry, farming and food policy future working group um, doesn't have any representation from Smallholding Scotland, which is the organisation that represents smallholders, nor does it have any representation from the Scottish Crofting Federation. It's outrageous. It is outrageous. <laughs> um, 
so at the moment, the one thing is, and, and you know, we've got NFUS, we've got Scottish Land and Estates, we've got RSPB, we've got Citizens Advice Bureau. <laughs> <laughs> um, so who are, who are well known for tractor driving. Um, so it's a wee bit worrying that there's a bit of talking the talk but not actually walking the walk on this. Um, I think some of the problems that small farms um, experience, and I think this, this you've, you've already raised, I think there's pressure to expand. Small businesses are almost always under pressure to get bigger, yeah. even when it's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and I know small businesses who have felt obliged to expand, um, particularly by the supermarket sector, mm -hmm. um, and then have had the rug pulled out from under their feet mm -hmm. and have folded the business or ended up selling it on to a bigger concern. But we're very, very bad at cooperating. We're very bad at cooperating. It's like helping cats. Um, and I think if small farmers could get better at cooperating, then we could benefit from the economies of scale without losing our individual identities and the diversity that's so attractive about small farms. But very often small farmers are busy. Uh, we're running farms. Very often we have other jobs as well. Um, and we don't have the skills to put together cooperatives. So it's not just about money for the day-to-day -day stuff that we need. It's specific money to help us get that expertise in place to let us build things like cooperatives. Because it's not something that Joe Public or me um, can just say, oh, well, I'm going to start a cooperative for whatever. Mm -hmm. it, it's much, much more difficult than that. Um, so I think that would certainly help. The issues of infrastructure, um, you know, we've already shot two abattoirs, uh, Dan and I. We've shot St Andrew's abattoir. We used to use that, and it closed. Then we moved on to Dunblane, and it closed. Um, so now for uh, pigs and cattle, we have a, a five-hour round trip to the nearest abattoir at Shops. Um, sheep's not so bad, we can go to Cooper, which is about 40 minutes away. Um, there's a small abattoir there, just recently owned, EU funded. Um, uh, so, you know, hopefully he's, he's on a stable financial footing now. Um, but we have, we have a, a, a two and a half hour drive to Shops to drop off um, pigs and cattle. Um, Things like getting food processed, getting meat processed is, is quite difficult. Getting butchers who are, are happy to do it and happy to do it to a standard that our customers want. Um, I mean, let's face it, if I say to my butcher, you're not doing that, right? I'm not coming back to you next year. You know, he doesn't care, really. I mean, he likes me, but he doesn't like me that much that he's going to change his business to suit me. Um, so I think support for cooperation, um, I think. Access to training and information, and appropriate training and information. Um, one of the issues that I have at the moment is that Scotland has a farm advisory service. Um, when I did my degree in agriculture, well, any ago, um, it was run by the government. It was DAFs. Lots of my former colleagues, my, my former study mates, I went to work for DAFs uh, when they graduated in the, in the early 80s. Now it's commercial. And um, it's very large farm focused. And again, they make noises about helping small farms, but actually they don't. And very often, they run lots of events, but when you go, it's difficult to see the relevance to your small farm. I went to one about liver fluke and cattle, um, and they sort of went around the room and they asked how many cattle you had, and I said, I've got three. <laughs> <laughs> Which was about a tenth of the normal, the normal size of the, the herds. And everybody just looked at me, I can't do it. And I said, well, my cows get fluke as well. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think cooperation in, in accessing land, um, we now have a, a, an organisation called the Scottish Farmland Trust, which is trying to mirror a French organisation in, in um, buying land, farmland, putting it into a trust, and then renting it to... Um, people who want to farm in an agro-ecological -eco way, but they're not getting off the ground very quick, bless them. Um, and sadly, the Scottish Land Fund 
only lends money to geographic communities to buy land. It doesn't lend money to, it doesn't give money, it's not a loan, it doesn't give money to communities of interest. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't say to you people here, do any of you want to come and have a small farm in Scotland? Does anybody want to come and have a small farm in Scotland? Um, and we could get together and we could go to the community land fund and say, well, we'd like to buy 300 acres and divide it up into you know, 15 small holdings. They can't give us that money. They can only give it to geographic communities. And I think that's a, that's a weakness in the system. Of course, the government could do it because we have a piece of legislation still in the statute books from, uh, I think it's from 1911, 1919. But it was after the war and it allowed the government to buy up land and divide it up into small holdings. Now it was for returning soldiers, but you know, we can pretend. <laughs> um, and, and we are sort of saying to the government now, you know, maybe it's time to resurrect this and maybe mm. let's try it. You try yeah. buying someone. And unfortunately all the holdings that were bought then have now been sold. Uh, are in private ownership and very often no longer used for, for food production. Um, so yes, I, the issues are, are, are what's already been said, issues of land loss. Uh, where we are in Angus, we have some of the, the best agricultural land in Scotland. Um, while Scotland's blessed with a lot of land, a lot of it's rock. Um, and we don't have that much what you would class as prime agricultural land. Um, Angus is part of that prime agricultural land and the houses that are sprouting up must be getting extra nitrogen in the soil because they've grown at a hell of a rate. Um, so we're concerned about land loss to, to, um, to housing and we understand that people have to have homes but the easy option seems to be to build on green fields rather than tackle some of the other issues around housing. Um, access to land, affordable land. Uh, the amount of houses going up pushes up the price, so uh, land in Angus sells for about £15,000 an acre. Which, if you go to and look at how much you would have to pay to repay the loan on that, you can't, unless you find oil on it, <laughs> which of course we wouldn't be taking out of the ground because that would be a bad thing, um, you can't, there is nothing you can farm on that land that will even pay the interest payments on that. So, how, how, how do you get started? Um, and land dereliction, and that's a big issue um, in, in the northwest of Scotland. Um, I was horrified when I was up there with Salsa to see the number of derelict crofts. Um, it was just utterly astounding at how much land is not worked, um, despite there being legislation in place to prevent it. But there's, there's just not the enforcement, the ability to enforce it. So, on that cheery note, I'll take one urgent question. <laughs> Anybody? Barbara. Um, this issue about um, farmers not collaborating. What do you think is the main reason for that? Oh, just awkward. <laughs> Pure cussedness. I think, I think people very often um, have small farms because they want to be independent. They want to divest themselves of the control that the supermarkets have over their life. So, speaking personally, I quite like to be able to go to the supermarket and take like two minutes to deliver it because most of the stuff is produced at home. Um, but alongside that independence comes the kind of inability to compromise with, with other people. There's also issues of things like geography, it, it, just practical issues like that. Um, but big farmers do it. Big farmers mm -hmm. share machinery. Mm -hmm. They buy cooperatively. But small farmers don't yet. Um, so it would be interesting actually to you know, to, to speak to some of the people in Norway where yeah. they are very good at cooperating. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think I feel a study visit coming up. <laughs> 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 <Can you mind? laughs> Further research is needed. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Bill, if it's a quick one. Well, it's a, I, I see it. Thank you very much. It, the, 
the thing you hinted at about an opportunity for farming without land ownership for the next generation of young farmers is one of the other things that joins Africa and Europe, where there's a fantastic opportunity for young people to aggregate land without owning it. And there's also common constraints to it. Uh, it in Africa, it's the uncertainty of tenure. And here we have a lot of aging farmers or people who bought a house and don't know what to do with the land, mm -hmm. don't want to uh, have strangers bumping around their land. Mm -hmm. But they're all this underuse of land and the opportunities for young farmers to, to aggregate and get a livelihood without ownership seem to be <coughs> really under undervalued in policy and, uh, and yet are surely a, a route to, to getting much more food. Yeah, I mean, in, the, in Scotland, the um, there have been some, some uh, moves towards that, um, of, of trying to land match people who want to farm with um, people who have land and, and don't, you know, either don't want to or aren't able to farm it, through, whether it's through contract farming or, or whatever. Um, I think there is... I think there is something in us, though, that wants to own the land that we steward. You know, I think that there's that, that thing about the land belongs to you, even if it's a temporary belonging, and eventually we'll belong to the land. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's... I mean, at the moment, I mean, speaking personally, we rent... We, we own 12 acres and we rent 10, and we have it on a seasonal way. Year by year? Year by year. So you... There's no incentive to improve. No, that. it's very difficult. I mean, it's, it's a bit of land that would certainly benefit from some investment, but, but I'm loath to, to spend the money. Well, one, one because I'm getting quite old, um, and two, because I have no security of tenure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if the landlord would give me a five-year tenancy, I could draw down government funding to help to, to improve the land. But I can only, he says to me I can have it for as long as I want, but he won't give me anything in writing, so I can't get any money to approve it. So the rushes continue to grow, um, and, and I'm not alone. I mean, this is a, a big, big problem. And, and we've got the Scottish Government putting pressure on um, public bodies to release land for what they call new entrant farming, which is great, but it's a 10 year tenancy. So what happens at the end of 10 years? Where do you go after the 10 years? Because you have to move on. So it, It's a good idea, but I think in 10 years time, you know, it's all going to come home to roost. When you've got lots of experienced farmers milling around and not actually able to find anywhere to, to do their stuff. Great. Thank you very much. You want to have a seat? I had a list of Backup questions in case there were like awkward <laughs> silences, but I don't think there's any like risk of that. So I'll just open it up. Uh, I'll give a chance for people to, to ask questions if suddenly like people are inspired. I have a man here, so um, who wants to start? Please. And can you say who you are, please? Yeah, please, me from ODI. Um, I don't think there's been any show price, the price of farmers getting into our gate, and whether that's been a pressure on small farms, so working in you know, supermarkets competing in this country and France, I think Germany as well, you know, there's pretty, there's, there's a surprise war, and that surely rebounds down on farmers, but maybe these small farms aren't sell selling to these big supermarket chains, so maybe they're not suffering so much, maybe they're selling to more niche local markets, I mean, can you just talk about that, or is that not an issue, this price of the farm gate issue? I think Who would like to take that? Take yeah, please. I think definitely it, it, it is an issue because what we saw, the, many farms, they sell to other channels. So if they sell to other channels, they have other prices. Mm -hmm. But uh, for instance, the small farms in Southern Europe who sell to the more mainstream, mm -hmm. they sell to these cooperatives and then the cooperatives sell to the big, the big buyers. And there the price is really low. Right. But they don't have the capacity to innovate somehow. So the, the same olive oil is sold with a lot of added value from an Italian bio farm which sells to a specific buyer in Sweden, and, in, and they pay and they receive like 20 euros per liter, while a Portuguese <coughs> or a Spanish farmer receives two 
or three euros per liter. So that means that they go on, that they don't risk anything because it's like you know it's it's they they are logged in in a certain type of of um, of yeah, pathway and they cannot really go out of it. So it's less attractive for younger farmers this type of um, of, of chain. And I think it would be really good if it could be that if we could add more value to this product, with a specific product anyway, would make it possible for more small farms to, to go on, or new farmers, new small farms to come. So this is why, I mean, there are cooperatives, but they are not good enough in negotiating, for instance, big, better prices. Their individual farmers do better. So it will be really important to, to, to have this. But not all, not, not all small farmers are sensitive to it, because many sell with through other chains. So short supply chains directly to the consumer. Um, and before I give it to you, Vicky, I just to say that I was posing to you the question earlier whether maybe food needs to be more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But then from the point of view of the consumer, as Bill was saying, maybe the little and the Aldi are like the best solution. So well, just to add... To yeah, it's a, it's a huge topic, that. I, I mean, the reality, in the UK, farmers get 8% of the gross value added of the market. Mm -hmm. So 8% or 8p of every pound spent on food goes to the farmer. And, and that has big implications for what a farmer can do, small or, or medium or large. And I think that's been, I, I've been working on that for a long time to get better supply chain regulation. Um, what's exciting is that Europe has just passed the um, Unfair Pro Trading Practices Directive. As a direct result of, of campaigning and lobbying by farmer unions, but also by Oxfam, Fair Trade Foundation and Tradecraft, really, really effective lobby, all of them saying, this isn't working. It's, it's undermining farmers' ability to, to treat their animals properly, to treat the land properly, to, treat their, to pay their workers a decent wage, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And, and they've um, got this new directive, which it's not absolutely directed at prices because that would be seen as anti-competitive and, and you know, it's too difficult to do that. I think there is a case, possibly, for setting market prices, but... There's, there's a lot of problems with that. In, you know, eco economists would have to talk to you for about three hours about why that's not a good idea. But the unfair trading practice directors will curb the practices which undermine farmers' ability to do what they want to do when they need to do it. And we, we, it, it was slightly built on something that was um, formed here called the Groceries Code Adjudicator, which administers a code um, of practice for the big 12 retailers. I'm going to go very short now, but um, there's been a whole you know, process of that groceries code adjudicator in the UK starting to stop unfair practices by the 12 big retailers, originally 10, it's now 12. I think it now includes Ocado and BMJ, but all, all the other supermarkets. But what we've been calling for is a um, fair dealing regulation for the rest of the supply chain. So they play fair as well. So farmers get a better deal, better contracts, are not unfairly treated, you know, asked to deliver at midnight, you know, all sorts of ways in which it's known that the, the supply chain can be unfair on, on farmers, and particularly small farmers. Although I agree some small farmers are, are selling out with the, the big retailers and the big manufacturers. But the new fight, what was thrilling to find in the agriculture bill last year was that it agreed with us and they put a fair dealing clause in the bill. And that's actually been improved in the, in the more recent bill that came out last week. So I could talk more about that if anybody wants to know, but it's, it's, it's interesting because it now doesn't include reference to first buyer. And you were talking about the first purchaser being, mm. being everything, but it, it, that squeeze can come at any point in the supply chain for the farm. And the squeeze might be yeah. you know, way down there. And, and so if the bill had been purely on first purchasers, it would have missed problems down the chain. So we, were, we lobbied hard over the whole of last year to get that first purchaser changed to business purchaser, and it's called business purchaser now, to separate it from the farming community. So it's quite an exciting time to see what we have. It's not quite an answer to your question, because I think you've got a really good point. Why aren't we valuing the primary produce better? And that's, that's a big, huge um, question, and, and whether we should be making food more expensive, making food that isn't costly in terms of the environment, more expensive, or well, less expensive, you know, there's, there's big issues there. And then you come across the whole political um, uh, climate of trying to, of, of food banks and problems with people eating, which is actually nothing to do with the price of food. It's to do with people's incomes and wages and uh, welfare um, provision. So it's a very political issue around the price of food and, and should it be cheaper or more expensive. 
but we have some chinks of light, I like to think. <laughs> Great. That's, yes, please. Um, I, uh, I, I, uh, I, I joined the session. I was thinking sustainability would be every other word that you would, you know, pronouncing. Uh, and and uh, to me, the, um, the beauty of small farming is the ability for those small places to have more diversity in what they crop. You have more respect for the soil to treat agriculture not like an industry but like a, a practice uh, to get much more revenue out of an, of an hectare than if you do a mass production. And I haven't heard uh, you comment and express yourselves on that. I'll be super interested to know what's the, what's the take on you know, the sustainability agenda. Who wants to go first? I'll talk to somebody. Yeah. Well, I, well that, that was one of the challenges of salsa from the beginning, but we took it a bit broadly. So we, what we wanted to, because there were many questions in the salsa project from the beginning, so we opted to look at how, how do small farms are placed in the food system and whether the way they place themselves, would, what, what, is, what is threatening them. So assuming that they were in, in somehow what we, you know, if they had more, more diverse um, ways of selling their products, they will be more resilient, for instance. So there was, we didn't really explore all the dimension of sustainability. But one of the things we, for instance, we assessed is this question of that they are all providing food to the household and to their neighbors, so it's food which is never going out, being, or it's very little being, needs very little in terms of conservation, it's not being transported. So it's normally food which will be, which will have a less ecological footprint. So in this way, they, they, they are adapting more to, you know, to the requirements we have now regarding how, how should be the footprint of food. So we don't have it directly. We don't have answers, very direct answers, but we have some contributions to this debate and to this understanding. And it's true that it was there in the definition of, of the salsa question, but we had too many questions, so we opted to lose some of them and not all of them. So it's more for future. The, the reason I think yeah. is interesting to the debate is because yeah. lots of the debate is around the value, yeah. the price of the land, the mm -hmm. distribution, yeah. the, the revenue for the, mm -hmm. for the farmers. And yeah. I think the, the route of sustainability is a very interesting route yeah. of course. to create the value yeah. and therefore to, yeah. to improve the, the mm -hmm. whole debate. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Just, just, just quickly, I, I, I referred to the briefing that we produced in, in support of our um, statement on why we need to keep small farms, and, and a lot of that is, does cover the issues around um, uh, sustainability and, and um, biodiversity, climate, and, and where the benefits can be identified from a um, small farm or a mix, mix of farm structures. The reality is, when, when somebody did a very large study um, a few years ago, there there um, results showed that you can have very bad small farms and you can have very yeah. bad big farms, you can have very good small farms. Yeah. There isn't really a correlation with size in, in the UK. I don't know if they were covering Scotland, actually. I think it might have just been England. But, um, yeah, it applies in Scotland. Yeah, well. yeah, so you get good, big, bad, big, and that kind of thing. So it's not an automatic correlation. But I, I, we see a very be big benefit in having small farm structure and medium farm structure, size farm structure, f because they will deliver potentially lots of sustainability, a lot of sustainability agenda, but they will need to be supported in delivering that in, in different ways, training, advice, support. Mm -hmm. Let me just quickly follow up with you. How much, so I imagine that there is some, something inherent in smallholder farming that involves an event of environmental stewardship, as it were. And as you say, how much of that is deliberate, in your case, versus just that is the way you operate? And you're not like deliberately thinking about like the greater good, just that is the way I run my farm. Um, it's, for us, it, well, it's, it is deliberate. Uh, some of it's just laziness. Um, we have, we have parts of the farm. But who was talking about tidy farms? I was, I said passive, passive environment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, we have bits we haven't even got to yet. We've been there 10 years, and there's bits we've, we've you know, we walk past it regularly and think, we must get to that at some point. Um, but it's full of bees and insects, yeah, it's and so, so, so we've stopped yeah. worrying about it now. Hedgehogs, we have lots of hedgehogs. Um, well, you'll get lots of money for that. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so, it, yes, I think it, for us it has been, to some extent, deliberate. Um, but on the other, some of it's been forced on us simply because of, of constraints of time and, uh, and effort and so on. And I think, I think you're absolutely spot on. There are good big farmers and mm. there are mm. not so good. Uh, it's not about size. Mm. Um, I think what's kind of interesting, though, is, is maybe where the people come from. Mm. Um, my vet, who is marvellous, um, but not free, <laughs> um, likes smallholders because we tend not to have uh, a background in farming. So many smallholders, it's, it's their first move into in small-scale farming. So we ask for advice and we take it. Because we haven't got granddad standing at our shoulder saying, we never did it like that in our day. No. So we, we're more... We're, we're open to ideas if we can get access to them. But as I, as I said earlier, sometimes we have a, a phrase in Scotland. Can I swear a wee bit? Um, Look at yeah. the train videos. Okay, I don't care. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll later, don't we, we, we have a phrase in Scotland that says, when you're up to your arse and alligators, it's difficult to think about draining the swamp. <laughs> and, and that actually applies. You're, sometimes you're so busy keeping the plates spinning that you know, yeah. you're not maybe at the forefront. I like the thing about retro innovation. Hmm. Yeah. My horse pulls things. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our that's retro yeah. innovation. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe can I say sure, something more about it? Because one dimension, we, didn't, we don't call it so much sustainability assessment, but if we think about the, the regions, what we saw, these regions we analyzed, that small farms are really uh, distributing food in informal ways, to different types of other people, which very often are the poorest in the region. So, if the poor, so from a social point of view, from social sustainability, those people in the Mediterranean and in Eastern Europe, especially, those people have so low incomes that they would have really a very, very poor diet if they were in urban areas. While there, they have access to this diversified food because each small farm feeds a number of other people around, neighbors and friends and family and. You know, so there is a dimension there which I think needs to be more highlighted, which, which is not often shown. It's not just that it is informal, but it is informal also in this type of population, which otherwise will be much well, uh, well no, not well off, much less well off. What is it? Better. Yeah. So it's from a social point of view, I think there's a contribution there, which is clear in Salsa, shown in Salsa. Okay, before I give it to Seth, Someone who has not had the chance to... Yes, please. Thanks for that, uh, Richie, from Action Aid. Um, so I was quite interested in um, the farmers identifying climate as something that they are quite concerned about. Mm -hmm. And Vicky, you talked a lot about um, you know, multiple reasons why small farms, you know, social cohesion. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what was the conversation that farmers were having because a lot of the farmers, or at least cattle farmers, are being quite vilified and under, mm. under attack. So on one hand, they need to adapt, but they're also being vilified. So what's the conversation that they're having, and what kinds of technologies are they also sort of looking for mm -hmm. to help them adapt? Uh, because again, there's all kinds of so-called solutions or false mm. solutions that are mm. being proposed, and especially mm. if the agriculture policy is linked with much more with environmental payments, mm. Mm. Um, what's the risk as well? Yeah. Mm. Well, in SAS, it was a surprise for us that because we asked in the survey, we had two main sources of information relating to small farms, which was the surveys and then the, the workshops where we were, you know, at the regional level discussing about the food system. But this came mainly from the surveys where we asked them what you think is the, the highest risk you are facing. And we thought it would be more, you know, lack of labor or or uh, difficulties in having um, um, access to, to financing. But climate change came as a very strong, so the, the, the dominant was climate change. And mainly it's, you know, if there will be less, in Southern Europe, if there will be less water or the rain, the, you are very much depending on rain for water availability. What will happen if we have less rain? And then the question that we don't have the resources to apply new technologies, for instance, for having other types of, of uh, you know, 
drop drop irrigation or these kind of things. It's it's expensive, or maybe there are new ways and we don't know. Or replacing or replacement of a certain variety for another variety. There there is development. We know it's you know there's knowledge, but we don't have access to it because we don't have extension services. So I think it's this type of conversation. We know there's a threat coming. It will change and it will demand adaptation from us, which we are not sure we will be able to do because we don't have the resources. I think it was mainly mainly this. So they are not placing themselves in a situation where they have they have an impact on the environment. It's more what we are doing. We are fragile in what we are doing. So if it, if this changes, so it's not so much about regulation changing. About it's about the conditions. If the conditions change, we will probably not be able to adapt because we don't have the means for that. Can I just say some of it? Um, we've already said that um, you know that a size is not a, a, an indication of, of how good a farmer you are, um, and and I think the same at the moment cattle farmers are getting a really really hard time, um, but in the same way cattle farmers are being lumped together as a, a homogenous mass, which is plainly not the case. Um, the media likes this, it's a, it's a good story to run just now, it's the right month for it. Um, so um, there's an awful lot of misinformation and there are, there are people, the, the media is representing cattle as, as the whipping boy for this. Um, and um, people are getting half a story. Uh, they're getting uh, aggregated figures across the globe. Now, I absolutely don't think that we should be keeping cattle in, in feedlots. I do not think we should be feeding them grain. If we can grow grain, let's feed it to people. Let's feed cattle grass. It's what they're physiologically designed to eat. I don't want to eat grass. Um, <laughs> so, yes, things need to change, but it's wrong for, for anything to be portrayed as a, a one mass. We're actually... Um, our cattle, for, exist, for instance, only get grass. That's, that's what they eat. They eat dried grass in the winter and they eat fresh grass in the summer. Um, and that, that comes through in the quality of the, of the product. Um, so it, it, it is misinformation. Just to say very quickly, one of the things that we've started doing is we run farm tours on our farm. So we let people come along and, and tour the farm and see the pigs and the sheep and the cows. And we don't hide anything from these kids. We tell the kids, see these pigs, aren't they lovely? We're going to eat them. <laughs> and if you eat bacon and, and sauce, <laughs> and they're delicious. And you know, kids don't care. Kids are like, we love bacon, we love sausages. And their parents are going, don't tell them because they'll get really upset. <laughs> kids are really bloody. Um, and they really don't care. Um, but we have to get to the we have to get to the kids. We have to explain to them how farming works. If you want to be vegan or you want to be vegetarian, that's fine. But understand the consequences and understand what you're doing. It's not a sound bite. You don't save the planet by a symbol on the processed food from the supermarket. I'll make a comment. I, I, I was um, reading the Land Workers magazine, which is the magazine for the U Unites the Union, which is the main work union that represents farm workers in the UK. And they were surprised to find that they've surveyed their, their workers recently, and, and climate was the number one issue for them. It was amazing. And they were seeing real threats to their livelihoods, um, to what they were trying to do in their work, to their progression through um, their work, and, and you know, the impact on life, livestock. Which, which actually employs an awful lot of people in, in the UK. So I thought it was quite interesting, which echoed what you, you were surprised. I was, I was surprised, Unite was surprised by that reaction as, as being a really big threat, which I think is very good because climate is the existential threat. Um, but I think you're right to suggest that there might be some really false solutions out there. And I think pricing carbon and pricing, you know, I've got to give, a, uh, give evidence next week to something which is talking about a, a carbon tax in food and farming. Um, and there's all sorts of measurements being tried to do on building carbon in soil. And I can see the big guys being able to really pay for that to look right and small farmers not being able to afford that, I mean, particularly globally. But there's all sorts of pitfalls. Whereas, I, you know, I would like to see us being able to promote agroecological farming, diverse farming, um, which is mixed using breeds, you know, that are fit for the, for the um, 
climate and things like that. But measuring the outcomes of those things is not, not that easy in the climate sector, where the climate sector is really focused on data and kilowatts. And, you know, you've got to be able to measure it and get outcomes and measure, you know, be really robust measurement, and then you can get rewards. It's a, it's a very, I think there's a really potential big pitfall there. But at the same time, we've got to deal with climate, so... Yeah. I'll take maybe I'll take two. Li okay, I'll, 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 I'll go. We'll go. But let me take two very last ones, and I'll just ask you and you to ask. Then I'll give you a chance to answer. I'll cut in five minutes, and then we can continue the conversation upstairs with a glass of wine. Whoever has more questions, so please. Uh, sorry, my name is Falaki, and I've got two questions for you. Um, what can African farmers learn from uh, Scottish farmers? That's number one. Number two is the, what is your contribution to poverty regarding the sustainable development goals? Is that, because that is what I'm interested in. Thank you. And please. Um, I'm Barbara from the Centre for Agroecology, Water Resilience. <laughs> And I was interested in what you were saying about metrics and how mm. complicated it is to collect data. And I wondered if you found any evidence of co-developed metrics, of initiatives where people are trying to help farmers, work with farmers to develop metrics that they can measure benefits of biodiversity or, or carbon capture. And so I wondered what there was mm. out. Great. Um, feel free to address either or any of the questions. Uh, I can answer on the metrics one. It's, I know the same with Food Trust are doing some good work on developing a system of metrics which is really farmer friendly. Um, and, but it, it's linked into what the farmers will be able to then um, uh, say they're doing in terms of um, public goods and then get rewarded for those public goods. It's been a complicated process though, but it's doing it with farmers and farm community. Um, but it's, it's absolutely how it should be done you know, with, with farmers and growers to identify where, how you can sort of measure the outcomes of what you're doing. Um, difficult in a, a, a really good agroecological agro system because it's yeah. a complex system. I think that, that's actually quite interesting. Not actually something that I had thought about until about a minute ago. Um, <laughs> was that now I'm worried that when new policies come in, when new um, support payments come in, that there's a danger that small farmers will miss out mm. because although we're doing the right thing, we don't have the means to prove it. Yeah. Um, and if it becomes... I mean, there are industries being built on the back yeah, of this. Absolutely. Um, and, and it worries me now that we're going to miss out because we, we, we don't have the, the means to prove what we're doing. You know, I can count the hedgehogs, but mm. is that actually going to get me a, something that's going to keep me... Keep me sustainable. Mm -hmm. So now, now I'm worried. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I, Teresa, so I'll leave you the last word, but on the Africa question, can I ask my colleague Barbara, sorry to put you on the spotlight, but you have been much more involved. She's also part of the Salsa project and has been much more involved in linking this dialogue with the African partners. You went to a workshop we had in Nairobi precisely on this question of what can Africa learn from, from the EU. And indeed, what can they learn from Africa? Would you comment? Yeah. How would you answer that question? Yeah. I, mean, I can't answer the specific question about what they can learn from Scottish farmers because I wasn't involved in the Scottish reference regions, so I don't know all the details about that. But it's interesting because with the African reference regions, we actually asked the question the other way around as well. Yeah, so we actually said, well, are there things, considering that in Africa most farmers are small farmers, whereas in Europe only a fairly small proportion, are there things that European farmers can learn from African farmers mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, like all the, agri not all, but the large chunk of the agriculture advisory services, all the kind of services for farmers in Africa are, by and large, geared towards small farmers. They don't necessarily work very well, but, I mean, this is the sort of default farmer is a relatively small farmer. And... Um, Whereas in Europe, a lot of the small farms, as you said, fall actually underneath the radar because they're just not, not recognized as, as being farmers as well. Um, and there were some interesting things, like, for example, market information systems through SMS and so on, you know, like how to get information, digital information to farmers, which has been 
tried in Africa and many, many places, and in mm -hmm. Europe actually it's not so, so yes, dominant it's true. at all. Mm -hmm. So they were quite some interesting mm -hmm. findings. Um, the other way around, in terms of, I, I mean, as I said, I can't say specifically what, what farmers in Scotland might, <coughs> might be able to, to offer to farmers in Africa, but um, one of the questions we asked ourselves amongst the African reference regions was, like, if, um, if we can see how things have developed in Europe from, you know, 100 years ago, well, maybe a bit more than 100 years ago now, a, a structure where there were lots of small and medium-sized farms, and now we've gradually had fewer and fewer farms and had that, that structural transformation. Is this something that is likely to happen in Africa as well? Um, and of course, you can't generalize across a big continent, but um, there, are, um, there is a narrative that says small farms are not efficient, small farms are not able to produce, so do we need a consolidation of farms? Should some farms, I mean, uh, the British government, for example, had this uh, system in DFID where they talked about the, um, uh, what's it called, uh, moving up, moving out, stepping and up, stepping up, stepping. Mm. Stepping up, stepping out, hanging in. Hanging in, hanging in yeah. And so this is the thing, stepping Sick out, you know, basically mm. saying, you know, the farm is too small in Africa or in Asia or wherever uh, the British government is supporting um, agricultural development. And these people should just go and work in the Ethiopian shoe factory in the capital and, you know, vacate that land in order so other farmers can consolidate their farm. Um, and, um, and that is obviously mm. highly controversial, yes. especially considering that in Europe, a lot of small farms are part-time farms. Mm. Why shouldn't African farms be part-time farms as well? Mm. So if you find that your farm is so, so small that you can't actually make a good living of it, and you've got three children, maybe one of them is getting a job in town and being able to support and contribute to the family through, through that way. So um, this... Um, part-time farming model seems to be working reasonably well in, in big parts of Europe, whereas in Africa it's portrayed as a kind of negative coping strategy and something that shouldn't happen at any cost and farmers should just move. You know? so, um, so these debates were quite interesting, so just having that, you know, the, these discussions across the two continents which you don't have, have very often otherwise, you know, how often do we get can I, can I just pick up on the part-time farm thing? I think part-time farm is a great thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It moves skills from rural areas, to, from urban areas to rural areas. Mm -hmm. It very often moves capital from urban areas to rural areas. Mm -hmm. What's not yeah. I like about it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, my husband's a web developer. He would normally be urban-based, but because he can work from, from anywhere, mm -hmm. like our shed, um, <laughs> he... We can we can move these skills somewhere else. So I think far, I think part time farming's great. Would that be effective if you had that broadband though? Like if you couldn't. The infrastructure has to be in place. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's not always. Yeah. yeah I, I have to say, Canusti doesn't have the best broadband. <laughs> <laughs> and the fibre stops at the end of our road. <laughs> can I say something about the the assumptions about small being in unproductive? Just quickly, because... Um, 30 there, seconds. Very right, so, Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just guide you to... The Land Workers Alliance, which is an alliance of um, people who want land and want to farm in the UK, it's a brilliant set of, of, of people, they actually did a survey of, of the farms that they're working with, um, and they're small-scale farms, and she, she identified really high productivity, really high levels of production and um, capacity to produce... Um, I just, I just want to say that, because these are small farms and they're really productive. And it's a report which you can access on the Land Workers Alliance website. Really interesting to look at. So those assumptions that you can't be productive on small scale farms. So we didn't answer the question about SDGs, but uh, that's, it's a big one, one, isn't it? Well, <laughs> last 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay, I would say it's something else we can learn with each other, or at least from Southern Europe we can learn with Northern Europe. And I think for Africa also it goes that it's this question of adding value to your product because mm. it's diversified, because it's unique, because it's different from your neighbor's product. I think this is something we are not good at doing in Southern Europe. So it's Italians much better than the others. But we sell as, you know, it's just a product. Mm. And it's not just a product as the others. So this, you know, having, adding a brand to your product as a small farmer so that it's more valued by the consumer. <coughs> I think this is something we should think about as one of the strategies. It was much, much referred in Southern Europe that we need to have consumers with us, but we also need to brand it more as something which is 
specific and you will have, as a consumer, a much broader uh, range of choices and, and experiences if you take this type of products instead of yeah. mass production. And my the, colleague Christine about the metrics. How that group, uh, in, with the wine session. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. last, the metrics, no, we didn't find anything, but there's a lot of studies showing you. What, uh, how yeah. do you connect? What are you doing? Well, to sustainable development goals. Well, are, you, are you doing at all? Well, I'm, I have to close, unfortunately, yeah. but we can talk, continue the conversation in public. Thank you very much okay. for coming. Thank you for. Thank you. Before we say some, just for our communications team at IIT who have put everything together, everything you see, Anne, Juliet, all the Twitter, everything, they do it, they invited you, so thank you to them. Thank you to the panelists. See you upstairs.